Welcome to MITRE's Grand Challenges Power Hour. Here's our host, MITRE Labs Senior Vice President, General Manager, and Chief Futurist, Charles Clancy. Thank you. It's my honor to uh, join the group today and help kick off the uh, our latest installment of MITRE's Grand Challenges Power Hour. Um, this is a monthly series where we focus on um, major topics that sit at the intersection of, of, of really the future of science and technology and uh, equities across uh, both the, the, the defense and non-defense part of the um, government. And uh, the topic today really focused on health. So um, our, our specific focus today is in the path towards resiliency, building a healthy information environment of the future. Um, and today we're honored to convene uh, policy and industry experts to explore the current state of mis and disinformation. Um, and again, very important topic that we've seen highlighted significantly over the last few years, really, as social media has become a predominant source of information for um, much of our, our communities. Um, but really looking at the role of mis and disinformation and its intersection with health communications and public safety um, and how to build a healthy information environment where the public can have greater health and digital literacy, uh, all with the end of really building uh, better health decisions uh, for themselves, their families, and communities. Um, before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, please remember that this event is open to the public uh, and also open to the press. So please keep that in mind uh, when, when you're commenting both uh, in, in the chat uh, and also those that are representing and speaking throughout the, uh, the course of the event. Um, MITRE is uh, working on a whole range of really complex problems, uh, health and, and mis and disinformation being just one of them. Um, if you're interested in working with us to try and help some of these big challenges that are facing our nation and society, you can feel free to reach out to recruitinghelp at MITRE.org. Um, we're a lot, always hiring and always looking for great talent who can help uh, join the team to work on some of these issues. Um, as we go through the course of the event, uh, we will have information about our speakers and our panelists that we put in the chat. So please feel free to, to look there for more information. Um, also, as we get into the discussion, uh, if there are questions from the audience, uh, there's also a questions box uh, that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to click that, type in your question, and we'll kind of get those managed and sent over to the moderators who will be uh, handling the Q&A portions of the discussion. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Sarah Lovenham. Uh, she's the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, in this role, Sarah oversees HHS's Public Affairs Division and coordinates communication strategy and messaging across the department at large. Uh, the Public Affairs Division works to ensure the public hears about top departmental uh, priorities and initiatives tied to the HHS mission of building a better, uh, sorry, building a healthier America. Uh, the Public Affairs Division includes individuals who specialize in earned and paid media, uh, digital engagement and web content, broadcast media, research, Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, and emergency incident communications. Sarah previously served as a Special Assistant for Strategic Communications uh, to the then California Attorney General Xavier uh, Becerra. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me, and I do appreciate your warm welcome, Charles. Uh, I want to thank first all of you for the invitation to join you here today, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to discuss our health information environment, at least as I see it with you. But before I begin, I want to tell you about a hallway here in the Hubert Humphrey building that really illustrates why thoughtful public health communications at least is so critical as I see it to advancing the health of everyone possible in this country our friends, family, colleagues, and beyond all across America. Down the hall from my office, past the workstations of press, broadcast, and digital teams, is a hallway that contains framed pie charts, drawn and created by kids that represents the feeling of young people who are either living with HIV or family to someone living with HIV. This really gets to me as a mom of two young kids myself. Inside each circle are illustrations of hearts or happy or sad faces, squares, triangles, squiggly lines, and different colors that really represent how each child is feeling on any given day. One circle, for example, displays the words being adopted, lots of medicine, and friends. Another circle reads inside worried and scared. This hallway reminds me of why the work we do here at the Department of Health and Human Services matters, 
and it reminds me of the importance of public health communications for the health of people in our communities, particularly uh, those who are very young. More than 40 years ago, when the HIV AIDS epidemic began, the government's public health communications response to HIV AIDS wasn't just lacking, it was actually non-existent. In the early years of the epidemic, a public health communications response was led by activists through community education projects and also local campaigns in large cities, such as San Francisco and New York. Then news organizations, nonprofits, non-governmental organizations, and celebrities filled in the gap left open by the government, and they often worked desperately. It was also very hard, actually, at that time for misinformation to spread, but it still did. One group of public service announcements, for example, back then ran, had a tagline, rumors are spreading faster than AIDS and delivered messages debunking some of the most erroneously held beliefs about the HIV AIDS epidemic. It wasn't until 1986 that then Surgeon General C. Everett Koop issued the Surgeon General's report on acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And it wasn't until 1987 that President Reagan even mentioned AIDS in public. It wasn't until 1988 until the Surgeon General mailed a congressionally mandated information brochure on AIDS to every American household. But by that point, so many people had suffered and their families too. Today, we have drawn lessons from that era. And roughly 40 years since it began, the Biden-Harris administration today has a goal of ending the HIV AIDS epidemic by 2030. These lessons also extend to the Department of Health and Human Services under Secretary Javier Becerra, where we conscientiously work to build partnerships across the country to battle any public health crisis facing us. Let's take as a case in point our response to COVID-19 and vaccine information. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken very tragically more than 1 million American lives, 1 million. It has shattered communities and livelihoods, and it has probably affected every single one of you in this virtual room. Whether you are a parent who juggled school and work at home early on, or maybe still are, whether you had to care for a loved one who got severely sick, or perhaps still are, or struggled yourself in some other way. In public health, we have faced a host of challenges, beginning with how to communicate the, ch the changing complexity of the virus in real time, it's ever evolving still to, to this day, to how to combat the spread of misinformation. Early in the Biden-Harris administration, we developed a public education campaign with the motto, we can do this, to stress the safety and efficacy of COVID vaccines to people across the country, particularly in hard to reach places. Through surveys and focus groups and more, we've worked to marry our communications efforts with on the ground vaccination needs, community by community, but it's very hard work and it takes a lot of extra help from beyond our own network. It takes all of you. It takes the people you know across the country. We have a special emphasis on reaching people in underserved, underserved communities and in pockets where we know it's traditionally hard to get the news. To date, we have developed and launched many ads in 14 different languages to explain the importance again of COVID vaccines. These ads have been viewed in some cases at least 20 times by the average American, given the multiple mediums that we tend to communicate on routinely. But it's still hard work. There's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of unknowns. We have worked to help close a 10-point disparity gap in our nation's vaccination rate. We have significantly shrunk what's commonly known as the movable middle. That's the body of people who are on the fence about taking action, but ha who can usually be moved to take it. Uh, this is something that, you know, we are proud of, but we still have a lot of work to do. Today, 221 million people, as many of you may know, are fully vaccinated and counting. We've helped reach these milestones in large part thanks to trusted community leaders joining our efforts to engage their neighbors and loved ones, and thanks to a campaign that has relied on research and data to guide engagement. But given the outside roles of what we discuss as trusted voices in these efforts, I wanna focus a little bit on that because it has been really key to our efforts across the country. And it will be in the coming months. 
according to a study by the Ad Council, the majority of Americans turn to trusted messengers to make decisions, regardless of the social issue in focus. A trusted messenger is simply someone who's a close family member or a friend. It can be a doctor or a scientist, an academic or a religious leader, a barber or an athlete. It's somebody who you trust in your own community. Through the We Can Do This campaign, we launched what we called our COVID-19 Community Corps, a network of community leaders who have offered to serve as trusted voices, in some cases for many months, in some cases very recently, in an effort to empower trusted voices around them to build vaccine confidence locally. Today, the Community Corps that we have includes over 17,000 members of local communities across the country, stretching across healthcare, sports, faith-based organizations, and more. And this is really a key group of people to our efforts. Additionally, our campaign has engaged well over a thousand organizations and we work to reach people, um, again, regardless of age, background, um, based on where we know the need is high. Moving forward, the lessons from the pandemic will give us a North Star as we head into tomorrow and prepare for the, any future public health crisis. But again, our work is really far from over. Just this past weekend, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention authorized COVID vaccines for children six months old and up. I'm particularly thrilled by this news as a mom of at least one child under five. Already, our team is hard at work, engaging groups that work with parents across the country. But again, ultimately, it's those trusted voices. In the weeks ahead, we know pediatricians are going to be extremely important in playing an outsized role to help protect our kids. Misinformation, of course, continues to be a big challenge. Educating parents will require that we all work together, lean on those trusted voices, and continue to communicate to those pediatricians who now may be best able to reach parents across the country. Misinformation is bigger than any one of us. We see it online. We hear about it from potentially even friends and family members. Within HHS, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has taken the lead to address misinformation. In 2021, the Surgeon General released a Surgeon General's advisory on confronting health misinformation accompanied by a toolkit for community leaders. And just this past March, he issued a request for information on the impact of health misinformation in the digital information environment in the United States. That's a mouthful, but you can find it on our website, and it's been a really important way to hear from the public. Throughout the pandemic, to deepen our collective understanding of its sources and impact, these types of efforts have been critical. Like with any particular public health crisis, if not called out and addressed, misinformation has a chance to spread, indeed like a virus itself. To be sure, there's plenty of work that lies ahead, and at HHS we aspire to communicate in multiple languages through every medium possible, just like we have done in the months past. We are exploring ways through apps, through other digital tools to reach people where they are, um, but the misinformation that we continue to see uh, continues to be of concern and continues to be something we encourage anybody to help us track and report. We want to continue to be building on our global partnerships as well that we have revved up under this administration. While I lack time to elaborate on the importance of our global relationships that we have restored under this administration, um, they have been really critical to our battle against COVID and we're going to keep making sure we're exchanging information with our partners around the world. Improving health literacy in short and digital health literacy and communicating with all of our communities across the country in ways that will reach everyone possible where they are falls on all of us across private and public sectors among health advocates, media, government, and trusted messengers. So today, my ask of all of you is simply to help us reach people so that they get the best and accurate information to improve their health and in many instances, potentially save lives. Back in our Health and Human Services Department hallway that I described earlier, there is one pie chart that my eyes always return to. It says hope. That's what I hope to leave with you with today. Thank you very much.
Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, it was uh, excellent remarks, Sarah. Thank you so much for taking some time um, out of your afternoon to join us. Um, and really want to thank you for the work that you're doing in your organization and HHS more broadly. Obviously, the uh, pandemic has brought uh, a significant new focus to uh, public health and, and health communications. And um, hopefully we'll have some chance to dive into that in a bit more detail uh, with our panel. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our panel moderator, Dr. Denise Scannell. Uh, Denise is a senior principal chief scientist for health communication science uh, in MITRE's Health Innovation Center. Uh, she's currently leading projects and capabilities focused on improving our uh, digital health information environment based on the development of her evidence-based framework, uh, the Health Information Persuasion um, Exploration Framework, uh, acronym for that is HYPE. H-I-P-E, trademark. <laughs> um, Denise led uh, research to address the growing infodemic of mis and disinformation on uh, COVID-19 vaccines, resulting in the development of this unique framework hype uh, to support the creation and effective communication campaigns nationally and locally for underserved populations. Um, and I just wanna say, I had, a, had the opportunity to work with Denise on this, uh, I guess about a year ago, as MITRE uh, invested pretty significantly in uh, how we really amp up the, um, uh, I'd say, uh, basically people getting vaccinated, right? A year ago, vaccinations were becoming available, uh, a whole range of different challenges with getting uh, uptake of, of people getting jabs in arms. Um, and it was uh, uh, great to see the role that, that Denise and MITRE could play in really helping uh, bring together these, these two ecosystems. Oh, but uh, this framework uh, was published in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, the Journal of Health Communications, received recognition uh, from both the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization. Um, Denise, Denise will moderate our panel of experts in reflecting on the current health information environment and opportunities for a future environment that supports health for all people. Uh, so with that, I will hand the baton over to you, Denise. Well, thank you, Charles. Uh, for the generous introduction, and it was a pleasure working with you um, on vaccine um, misdisinformation work as well. And hello to everyone and welcome. It is my pleasure to moderate this amazing panel of experts from multiple sectors and areas of expertise. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, uh, the information networks that carry public health guidance into communities are among the most essential elements in a public health response. And unfortunately, in today's 24 seven information environment, accurate information is not getting through to everyone everywhere. Uh, the viral spread of mis and disinformation has been widely acknowledged as, as Sarah has mentioned and, and we've certainly heard broadly it's a major and growing threat to public safety and to effective pandemic response. So I'd like to introduce our esteemed uh, panel to help us um, dig into this a little deeper and provide um, some brief reflections of their work as, um, as well as where there are opportunities for the future. Because we need to move beyond the pandemic and mis and disinformation is not going away. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna ask our panelists to introduce themselves and their work. And um, I'm going to start with John Sands, who's the Senior Director for Media and Democracy at the Knight Foundation. Thanks very much, uh, Denise, and uh, to the entire MITRE team for the invitation to be with you today. It's really, really an honor. Um, I was fortunate enough to be in at the ground level when Knight Foundation began a series of major research investments a few years ago. So I've had, I, I think, um, an interesting perch to watch the recent growth and evolution of the field, uh, the field of research that's coalescing around some of the questions about information integrity and digital citizenship today. Um, maybe it would be helpful for me to offer a little bit of background on the thinking um, that's that's been animating some of our grant making. So, um, so for uh, most of you probably only know of Knight Foundation as uh, you know as a um, a blurb that happens at the end of a, a, an NPR or PBS segment that says this this segment was made possible with this through the sponsorship of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. That's because our 
Um, our institutional history traces back to two brothers who owned what at one point was the largest newspaper company in the United States. So we've had a, a longstanding interest um, and, and, and history in promoting independent journalism and media uh, in this country. Um, and so in, in uh, you know, our, with, with a focus um, on advancing democracy through informed, engaged, and engaged communities, um, at least that's how we've, we've been interpreting our, our founders' intent um, the past several years. Um, in 2019, our trustees approved an initial investment um, of $50 million to support the growth of a field of, uh, the, of research that brings together social science, data science, uh, network analysis, computer science, engineering, uh, humanities, and the law to understand and proactively inform the, the sorts of responses to the growing role uh, of, of digital media in our society that are, that, you know, are so clearly needed today. We made these investments to ensure that policymakers and that key stakeholders in industry and civil society are informed by independent nonpartisan research and that the, the new legal and policy frameworks protect the public interest and advance fundamental democratic values on topics such as content moderation uh, and free, free expression online, intermediary liability, uh, platform data access for researchers, a, a topic that's kind of risen to the, to the, the top of, of, of many policymakers' attention recently, um, and also the scale and appropriate roles of private technology firms in our society. To date, we've invested now more than $60 million in this research space, helping to stand up five new centers of excellence at universities around the country, and we're also supporting a host of new scholarship and policy work um, at more than 50 other institutions. By 2024, um, I expect that Knight's commitments will top uh, $100 million, constituting one of the largest targeted investments in the foundation's history, um, and I, I believe also one of the most consequential. Our initial, uh, in initial bets in the space have also helped researchers unlock more than $40 million in additional matching resources to support aligned research at academic institutions and policy organizations where we've invested. Um, and among the largest new investors in the space is the federal government. Uh, through our network's efforts last fall, the NSF created a new track in its Convergence Accelerator program uh, to support work on trust and authenticity in on online communication, a move that uh, will lead to an additional $30 million or so uh, injected into the field over the coming years. We've also seen the NSF make other important plays uh, that pretend a broader recognition of this field's increasingly critical role uh, and the more significant resources that are going to be needed to advance it. Um, so the, the questions that the field addresses are only growing more urgent, I think, as, as uh, Secretary Lovenheim indicated. And the field uh, continues uh, to be proving its significance to, our informed, uh, to an informed democracy. Our data tells us that our grantees are catalyzing something important, um, that there's real demand from policy and industry. And so at night, we're shifting our focus from simply being about getting something off the ground toward growing it um, and investing in its, its future sustainability. And uh, maybe here I'll, I'll, I'll stop and, and, and uh, let, that, let that kind of hang in the air for a bit and we can talk about it more uh, later on. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anna Gazinski. Um, my background is in communications and public health, and I'm currently a programmatic support contractor for the Health Communication and Informatics Research Branch at the National Cancer Institute. Um, and in that role, I've been heavily involved in the work that the branch has been doing on social media. Um, and at the beginning, I would say that our work was really very positive and optimistic. I think we and most other people in the field were really excited about the potential that social media could have for disseminating health information and delivering health promotion interventions and just helping us better understand the public's attitudes and behaviors. Um, and although we still really feel that social media can do all of these wonderful things, um, in the past couple of years, we really started paying more attention to some of the ways that social media might actually be harmful, focusing especially on misinformation. 
And I think that the dangers of health misinformation spreading on social media became really clear to everyone during the pandemic. And that made our job easier in a way because it was no longer a hard sell to convince people that this was an important research area that we really needed to focus on. Um, but I will say that even though I think everyone is now appropriately concerned about you know, the health and science misinformation that's spreading on social media. I don't think we currently have the data or the tools we need to really comprehensively understand or address um, health misinformation. So first of all, we need better surveillance. A lot of the research that has been conducted to date has consisted of cross-sectional content analyses, and usually the sample is small. The analysis generally focuses on just the text of the post, and it usually looks at data from a single platform, most often Twitter or Facebook. Um, these studies are important, but we really need to start expanding our research. Um, for example, we need to look at a wider array of platforms, including visual platforms like Instagram and TikTok. Um, and even though it's harder to analyze than text, we really need to engage with the visual aspects of the content on these platforms because we're missing a lot if we don't study the images and videos and memes that are circulating out there. I think we also need to improve our monitoring of platforms that are used by diaspora communities like WeChat, as well as non-English language content on mainstream platforms. That's also been a bit of a blind spot in the research. Um, and we really need to just do more sophisticated work that accounts for the complex spatial temporal network and cross-platform dynamics of misinformation. A lot of the current research looks at platforms individually in a kind of vacuum, but conceptualizing social media as a decentralized but interconnected ecosystem could help us better understand how misinformation and misinformation agents move and operate across platforms. We also have to better understand the drivers and predictors of susceptibility to misinformation. There is some evidence to suggest that certain factors such as trust and literacy predict susceptibility to misinformation, but evidence for the role of other factors like age, for example, is mixed and research on other potentially important factors like emotions is very limited. We also need to better understand whether certain communities might be more susceptible to misinformation on social media because they lack access to alternative sources of information. We need to understand disparities in information exposure and acceptance so we can better identify communities and individuals that may be a greater risk for harm. And that brings me to the third priority, which is the need to understand what the harms actually are. I think there's been a lot of concern during the pandemic about how social media misinformation is contributing to vaccine hesitancy and anti-masking attitudes and these kinds of things. But I'm not sure we actually have a lot of really conclusive research, either in the context of COVID-19 or cancer or other health topics, showing that exposure to misinformation on social media is actually causing real world effects rather than reflecting trends that are happening offline, for example. So I think there's more work that needs to be done to demonstrate what the consequences of exposure are. And finally, we need to develop and test interventions to mitigate these possible harms. Studies have shown that corrections and fact checking can be effective to an extent, but these approaches have some important limitations. So in an ideal world, you would prevent people from being exposed in the first place. Another promising approach is to inoculate users against misinformation, which is also sometimes called pre-bunking. Um, and these kinds of proactive strategies aim to prevent misinformation from gaining traction in the first place, rather than trying to correct it once it's already been accepted. Um, and increasing the public's health science and media literacy could be another important prevention strategy. And it could make the public, you know, if the public understands more about the scientific process, they may be less inclined to believe overly simplistic or sensational claims. Um, and we also need to understand the impacts of social media policies and practices, uh, which are also in themselves interventions. But right now, the impact of these measures that are adopted by platforms is largely unknown outside the companies themselves. So more data access and transparency for researchers is really needed. Um, and I'll stop there. Okay. Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today and to share what the MITRE team has been working on related to a healthy information environment. My name is Linda Desens, and I am a principal health communication scientist with the Health Innovation Center here at MITRE. I have been with MITRE since 2018 and have had this unique opportunity to work on this critical issue of mis and disinformation and how it impacts the health and public safety of our nation. 
Although it seems like mis and disinformation just became a critical issue, it's not new and it has been around for a long time. Our MITRE health communication team has been watching it closely for quite a few years and saw that it was becoming a growing threat. But why is it such a threat? Having accurate information is critical to positive health behaviors and positive health outcomes. This is why we view this as a matter of public safety. So what has changed? For one, information is now more, now more accessible than ever through social media. There has also been a power shift. People are more responsible for their own health. They don't get all of their information from their medical provider as they used to. And finally, now more than ever, people are able to control what information they see, where they get it from, and what information they want to accept and remember. Pew Research estimates misinformation can be as high as 60% of the information we receive on any given day. Much of this information is designed to pique our interest and make it past our mental filters. With COVID-19, we really saw this critical public safety issue explode to a whole new level. Enough for the World Health Organization to call it an infodemic and our Surgeon General to call misinformation a major threat to public health. At the start of the pandemic, our health communication team began a research initiative looking at the persuasive nature of the amplified mis and disinformation. We focused our energy on COVID-19 vaccines because in the beginning of the pandemic, we were seeing the challenges in getting people to wear masks. We knew that with the development of the COVID-19 vaccine, that there would most likely be challenges with vaccine hesitancy and adoption. For our team, it wasn't enough just to detect mis and disinformation. We wanted to understand it so we could counter with effective messaging. Using evidence-based theories, we analyzed social media posts to uncover what made messages persuasive and how we could craft counter responses. So we asked, what would be the most effective? How do you get accurate information past an individual's mental filters. Through this research, we developed the health information, persuasion, exploration, or for short, the HYPE framework. So what is the HYPE all about? The HYPE framework is a MITRE health mis and disinformation response framework with an AI persuasion algorithm that marries social listening with behavioral science to drive precision insights and counter responses on the ground in local communities. The framework identifies key steps to gain intelligence, understand the potential challenges and barriers, and apply evidence-based health communication practices <laughs> as part of a multi-pronged approach to explore opportunities in designing communication campaigns and effective interventions. We are really excited to have been able to translate our research and apply the HYPE framework to disproportionately affected populations, such as the Black Haitian community in Miami, Miami-Dade County, Florida, and currently with the migrant farmer community in Central Valley, California. So far, we have shown great success in reaching communities at the local level to combat mis and disinformation. Most recently, we have applied the HYPE framework to the development of our HYPE lab. This lab is an interactive monitoring, detection, and response capability that incorporates the HYPE persuasion algorithm, as well as detection and response capability for use by health-related entities to provide evidence-based insights for countering this and disinformation. We are excited to launch the HYPE lab within the next few weeks. But to close, what we are really excited and hopeful about is that the HYPE framework and the HYPE lab can address not only COVID-19, but other domain areas such as climate change and mental health with the goal of building a healthy, resilient information environment of the future. Over to you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Reese O'Neill. I am an infodemic technical officer with the WHO's IRA program or the Africa Infodemic Response Alliance. Um, I've been in social analytics for about seven, eight years now and was fortunate enough to start with the NIH and um, their Ebola trials in Liberia. Now, um, they were kind of ahead of the curve and brought in some of these high power tools that we see today in monitoring uh, the information environment. And the challenge was getting um, trial participants to actually conduct these studies. So we had to face a series of obstacles and we looked at a multitude of platforms from uh, field teams on the ground, uh, social media and regular print media, such as newspapers. Um, it really helped me establish the foundation of how important the information environment is in public health works and uh, set us up for our future work in the DRC uh, just a few years later. This uh, Ebola outbreak in the DRC really brought home how damaging misinformation really can be. So this was a already pretty volatile environment. There were a lot of um, kind of foreign actors working here to try to contain this Ebola outbreak. And the misinformation led to a lot of damaging issues. We had treatment centers burned down, health workers attacked and even killed, and even burial sites where bodies were removed and individuals were exposed to Ebola that brought that back into their communities and would set us back. Um, following this, I worked under Africa CDC and helped create and develop their rumor tracking program that's still in operation today. And all of this has led me to my position at um, IRA with the WHO. IRA is focused in the Afro region, and the main foundation of IRA is similar to a lot of the platforms out there in that we monitor misinformation um, and try to identify trending rumors and also look at information gaps, because one of the um, most prominent issues you see in public health um, information is when knowledge isn't known, misinformation will fill those voids faster than accurate information. So staying ahead of that is crucial. The other component of IRA that's been um, really successful so far, and I think is going to be kind of the next step in addressing misinformation appropriately, is what we call viral facts. So as we put out our weekly reports and identify this misinformation or the trends that are popping up, we quickly assess those and, and decide how these need to be addressed. And um, viral facts publishes some very easy to digest uh, either infographics or videos that can be translated in a lot of different languages and applied in local contexts. So it gives us a rapid response mechanism. So we're not having to do the research and wait to see how this misinformation is impacting uh, the communities. We can get in front of it very quickly and try to slow down the viral spread before any of these rumors actually get roots. And the third component, which I think is frankly the most important, is um, the combat capacity building of IRA that focuses on bringing the monitoring of misinformation to the country level. So we have infodemic managers that um, are looking at all of this misinformation within their own country. They understand the local context and it really breaks away from the centralized notion of you know, trying to monitor uh, misinformation outside of some areas of expertise um, or uh, particular locations that you might not have that local context to really address it appropriately. And this leads me to um, kind of how we're dealing with the information environment around public health in general now. When I first started, um, we were a lot of the obstacles that we faced came from a lot of the traditional beliefs um, or traditional practices in medicine where um, a vaccine may not be accepted or taking someone's blood is not, is not going to work very well in particular communities. But now there are so many different vectors of information and the, the misinformation particularly is so well put together and produced that even some of us that are online all the time and have a uh, pretty good knowledge of things can still trip us up. So the information is coming from all over the world. We're getting, um, statements from the US, from Australia, from Canada, from Russia, all impacting the inf uh, African information environment as well. So it's led us to really dig in and try to find where those are beginning and what connects um, foreign misinformation to content in Africa as well that have people buying into this misinformation. 
It's something we certainly hope to work on in the future, and we've had a lot of success in dealing with um, over the past year and a half. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mark Malseed with Watershed Analytics, and I am delighted to join the panel today. Uh, I hope to share an industry perspective on the challenges of today's polluted information environment and how we can all build a space where facts can fight back against these falsehoods. I got my start in Washington as an investigative journalist working for Bob Woodward of Watergate fame. So I confess to a sort of always expecting that there are dubious hidden agendas and covert activity to contend with. That skepticism has been pretty useful in recent work at Watershed, uh, which is a media intelligence consultancy, uh, where we research and monitor how narratives spread in the news and online. We work with companies, NGOs, and governments to counter erroneous narratives and try to promulgate correct and favorable ones. Um, so while the Watershed name is fairly new, our team has been at it for about 15 years under several earlier incarnations. Uh, we've worked with many of the organizations here today, NIH, MITRE, ICF, HHS, uh, DOD, and, and scores of others. And straddling industry and government as we have over the years, a key thing we've been able to do is share best practices and innovations from the biggest firms in the world with the public sector agencies and help adapt those learnings to the very specific missions and budgets in the public sector. So I'll try to highlight one aspect of our work now and hopefully get a chance to maybe touch on some others during the Q&A. So uh, communications leaders at Fortune 500 firms are like you dealing with this brave new world of fast moving misinformation while contending with the age old human nature that dictates that once people lock in ideas and preferences, it's really hard and expensive to dislodge them. It's become a perfect storm for communicators who rightly want to stick to a script, carefully manage change uh, you know, in campaigns for an audience, but face these ever-changing attacks, curveballs, non sequiturs uh, from the environment. So, what we're seeing them do and urging them to do is think and act more like their marketing counterparts. Uh, big companies, you know, these are the kind of ultimate behavior shapers, right? Corporate marketers are tasked with creating new realities, sometimes out of thin air, and winning people over to them. So marketing departments at big companies tend to have what we don't have, right? Lots of money and, and staff. Uh, we just have migraines. And, you know, and we also have to hew very closely to the facts uh, where marketers get a little bit of creative license. So what we do is look for creative tech enabled steps that are budget realistic and can help to shift opinions and behaviors. What are a couple of these? Uh, number one, collecting and analyzing gobs of quantitative, qualitative data about audiences and about messages. This includes data from alternative media like podcasts, and niche social networks, um, even though, as Anna said, uh, this data is actually quite hard to collect sometimes. A uh, second thing is rigorous audience segmentation, targeting and message testing. Marketers do it all the time. Communicators we're seeing are starting to do a lot more of it. Uh, third is updated measurement metrics, particularly around what marketers call the customer journey. Uh, but for we communicators, uh, more probably termed stakeholder journey. Uh, and fourth, tracking not just sentiment, but the emotions of the audience. Where are people expressing surprise, contempt, optimism? Emotions tend to be strong behavior drivers. And just the sort of top level sentiment doesn't always get there. So the situational, situational awareness that comes with collecting all of this data can be very empowering and clarifying and opens up a range of tactics for actually intervening. Uh, and I'll quickly share two real world examples. Uh, first, we can build detailed network maps of the critical stakeholders and influencers on a, on a given topic. You know, maps that reveal how influence, how money and message points move through these communities, drawing on data from traditional and social media, as well as other open source intel. 
We did this actually to track rampant Russian disinformation in the U.S. commercial sector, while a couple of years ago, all eyes were focused on election meddling. And we've deployed similar mappings for a whole host of other situations, uh, including public health, military wellness, uh, and other ESG, uh, environmental social governance campaigns. Uh, second, you knowing the networks that we've established, right? We then use digital platforms to intervene at the key behavior decision points. This is kind of product marketing 101, right? Where and when is a consequential decision going to be made? When is somebody going to buy something or do something? Go there. Uh, for a DOD military health campaign a couple of years ago, we studied the advertising used by nutrition supplement makers and developed counter programming in the form of primarily Google search ads that warned of supplement dangers. And we put them right next to the ads selling the supplements. And actually it turned out that was unexpected to people looking for them, uh, eye-opening, and we saw astronomical click-through rates on those as one example. So looking ahead, uh, I think like the others on the panel, I don't see a future where disinformation and misinformation are going to be extinguished. I think we have to stick with anticipating as much as possible, containing and counter-programming aggressively. It's a collective challenge for all of us requiring patience, clarity, and primarily compelling stories that appeal to our fundamental human nature, which isn't going anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This should be a great discussion. I'm super excited to get started. Hopefully you are too. Um, so just an, just an opening question, um, very Briefly, I'm going to bounce around with the, the panel. Um, based on what you heard in Assistant Secretary Sarah Levenheim's um, presentation on the state and the future of health of our health information environment, what resonates um, with you the most based on your expertise and experience? And I think I'm going to start with John. Uh, sure. I mean, I, there, there were a handful of things that jumped out to me that that I think are kind of central to Knight Foundation's program. Um, one was the the, uh, um, the kind of urgency around the crisis in local news that that, that they're really um, that, that news deserts are a real thing and that they have uh, they have dramatic consequences um, for folks who who uh, who have no other place to turn for for accurate um, and timely information that that they need to make decisions about. Uh, their democratic participation or their health or, you know, you name it. Um, the other the other piece that resonated uh, with me was, you know, her call out of trusted messengers. Um, trusted messengers, uh, you know, within communities tend to fill a lot of information voids um, in, in, in interesting ways. And we've um, we've actually invested some fairly significant dollars in a handful of different um, different communities to try to better understand the way that the trusted messengers gain trust maintain trust um, um, among uh, you know di different sorts of constituencies and um, that research is actually underway right now I'd be happy to talk um, you know talk, talk to anybody kind of offline about the different projects we're supporting um, and to link you up with the, with the researchers but the uh, the communities that, we, that we've we've looked at are in the South Plains of Texas um, there's another uh, another uh, project that's underway in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and another in the on the south side of Syracuse. Um, and there there are really incredible researchers who are embedded in in these communities, um, and who themselves are 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 looked at as trusted messengers um, and have have a kind of uh, credibility credibility and legitimacy um, that they're able to leverage to better understand um, exactly how um, how information is circulating in, in, in these places where we're where in these fairly kind of isolated information environments. Um, and then, you know, finally, there, there was, uh, you know, I guess the, the last point I would pick up is that there's that there's a need for um, for platforms that, you know, like like ones that Meyer provides that help with the translational process between basic research that's happening um, you know, all, all, all in, in universities and, uh, and other centers of excellence around, around the world now. Um, but but the, the translational facility is, is still actually fairly significantly lacking, we've, we found. And so um, I think 
you're going to see Knight Foundation pivot quite a bit of, of its um, of its grant making to help support this translational function uh, better in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I like the, the, that you caught, you know, the, the trusted messenger piece, because it's not who you think it might be, it could be a barber. Um, so that that, you know, that was a really exciting experience. Um, as we were going through communities is seeing who constitutes trusted messengers. Um, Reese, what did you yeah. what stood out for you? So I'd actually like to piggyback on uh, what John said a little bit, um, you know, the urgency and the trusted messengers uh, together, um, because I think one of the biggest issues we'll face, especially over the next year, um, we're going to see really um, compounded media exhaustion around public health issues. So all this research that we're trying to do it's not going to be so easy to pull all this content and try to monitor how this is going because people just don't want to talk about it anymore. They yeah. don't want to hear about it anymore. Um, and while we're trying to get out accurate information and positive information, uh, for instance, about um, the young children vaccinations, that has not hit the level of um, interaction that we've seen with you know, other much more minor issues that um, have popped up in the past in the COVID uh, conversation. So, I would kind of double down on the urgency component of this research needs to be done immediately and very quickly to try to really capitalize on this information environment while we can before this really dips off. Because once we've kind of lost the attention there, all we're gonna be able to do is wait for another public health emergency to be able to really get into all of this content again. Because looking back at the content we've had before, all of this changes too rapidly to try to apply that in the future if we don't have a steady stream of information to really work with. So um, identifying those trusted sources now, really trying to leverage those as early as we can and using that urgency to get this research underway as fast as possible and make sure that we can really learn as much as we can while we can. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's not wait for another emergency, right? Let's Let's take our lessons and and uh, develop some some really good paths forward. Um, Anna, what do you think? Sure. So I I really appreciated um, the description of the efforts that were being made to reach um, hard to reach populations and to translate messages into 14 languages. I think that um, health communication inequalities are really important to keep in mind. Not everybody has access to information. Not everyone has access to information they can understand and that they can use. And I think that those things um, you know, they, they're related to misinformation because those things can leave people vulnerable to misinformation if they don't have good information, good sources of information, you know, and all they have is, um, you know, whatever they're seeing on social media, whatever they're seeing, um, you know, spreading in their networks and they don't have an ability to fact check it or they're not hearing um, anything that might make them doubt um, the misinformation that they're seeing. You know, I think that that makes people really vulnerable to misinformation. And so I think, you know, it's not just about sort of stopping misinformation, but it's also about giving people um, good information. And mm -hmm. I think that there are some communities that, you know, aren't getting the good information and that makes them more vulnerable um, to the misinformation that they're seeing online. Absolutely. And I, I think what Sarah said is all people everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is it's a critical point. Um, Mark? Well, uh, adding on to what you know, the three of you have already said, um, I would say I, what resonated with me was talk of health literacy, digital health literacy, as being a backbone of it all. Because you know, if, you, if you don't have to do as much core explaining, uh, you can get further along the message path. Um, if we're stuck with uh, you know, getting basic literacy across, that is a harder you know, longer hill to climb. Um, I think, you know, looking at the COVID environment, uh, Google, Microsoft, among some of the others online have, have really stepped up in recent years, the quality of the information that they're putting, you know, letting bubble up to the top of search results. Uh, that's helped. And uh, there's more quality info, less chance of falling into, you know, an information outhouse, if you will. Social media, it's a harder battle because it's so much user generated and you know the 
the constant filtering. Um, but I also think back of recently, you know, my own health literacy, that of, of my family during COVID, we learned a lot uh, we didn't know. Um, I can't say I have a deep background in biological sciences. Uh, so virology 101, you know, the geometric growth of, of diseases in a public health. Uh, among the most memorable and impactful, actually, I think, was this amazing video on how to properly wash your hands. It was so simple. Mm -hmm but very effective with uh, white gloves and a dark uh, dye showing how to wash your hands properly. I'm like 40 years, I haven't known this. Um, and it's, it's that, you know, <laughs> truly behavior changing that our technology today opens up a lot of ways to, to get those sort of basic core literacy messages across. And I would say in closing, you know, take advantage of every possible news hook to spread these kind of messages. News is when, you know, our public attention gets focused. And as we said, you know, there's going to be, uh, there's going to be fatigue here. We can use whenever something bubbles up to uh, inject these messages back into the dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Getting through those mental filters. And I, I think you've uh, coined a term that we've never heard before. So folks can say they heard it here first, information outhouses. So well done. <laughs> Um, so lastly, Linda, and then we've got a lot of questions coming in. So I want to make sure that we're engaging with the audience. So, so Linda, can you briefly just a couple points? Yeah, sure. Janice, thanks. There are many things that resonated with me in Ms. Levenheim's presentation, but there were two things that resonated with me the most. The first was something that I feel that our MITRE health communication team has really focused on during this pandemic, and that is translating our research into practice, especially with disproportionately affected populations. And I know John mentioned that too. Um, we have focused not only on the data from our research and many of our tools, but we have focused on really understanding and listening to the people in the local communities and the environment that they live in, what they value most, what are their fears, needs, social norms, needs of their families, preferred ways of communicating to include their primary language, and so much more. Um, we've also included community members in evaluating our messages. So, you know, we can make sure that the messages resonate with the audience. And working at the community level, we have seen how each community is unique and how our messages and interventions need to be customized for those communities. In the end, it's about people first and truly listening and understanding their uniqueness. Most importantly, we need to ensure health equity for all. Yeah, I think you both you and Anna, uh, you know, that health equity message and health literacy mm -hmm. and the, the critical importance of of meeting people where they are um, mm -hmm. is so important with with mis and disinformation. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to open up to some questions They're piling up here. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, so here's, here's one question. Um, that I'm going to pass over to John. Um, does the panel have any thoughts about changing how social media companies are required to monitor or manage the information, i.e. misinformation, that is broadcast via their platforms? And they put in parentheses, and I use the term broadcast purposefully because currently, unlike traditional media outlets, they're not regulated for their content, which we all know. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I certainly have I certainly have personal thoughts about, about this. <laughs> um, you know, speaking on behalf of Knight Foundation, I'm probably not not able to share them here. But you know, it's 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 certainly a a um, um, a, a funny question. It it's not one that uh, that we seem to have a set of um, of good norms to turn to turn to just yet. Um, and that's that's part of the reason why we're we're supporting so much normative legal research um, to, it's, it's explicitly about this question. Um, what 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 is the appropriate role of these companies, these ad companies that have taken on um, a, a, a sort of um, information intermediary role in our society? Um, and what are the what are the new sort of democratic norms that should shape how we um, how we how we govern them and how we regulate the, the kinds of content that they that they um, that, that they do. I mean, 
to, to, to use the word that Mike used here, broadcast, um, but, you know, proliferate or spread or uh, enable the spread of, you know, th there are a lot of different ways we could, we could talk about it. Um, you know, I, I would say that the, th there, there are, um, there are a couple of, of interesting schools of thought that are emerging um, and that, that, that seem to me to be bridging the, the ideological divide on these questions. Um, and you can you can see it emerging around some of the uh, the the work that folks like Danielle Citrone, uh, a legal scholar at the University of Virginia, has uh, has been working on over the past several years. Um, and uh, you know you also see it in you, you see uh, moments of compromise seeming to emerge among you know some of the the folks in Congress who have been kind of stalwarts of Section 230 over the years. Um, um, I, I don't think I'm breaching any confidence um, by saying that I, I I ran into Senator Ron Wyden uh, recently, and you know he 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 was an author of, of Section 230, and um, he said you know may, maybe maybe the time has come for us to revisit some some of these things. I mean, there there actually really are um, you know there really are harms that that are legitimate that need to be need to be debated need to be aired out. Um, and uh, you know maybe, maybe maybe there is a moment for us to to do that right now. Um, so yeah, that, that, without going any further, I'll I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the part of building that future environment is taking a critical look at the environment itself. Um, let's not, you know, fix the boat. Let's build a better boat. Yep. Right. So it requires looking at all those things. Um, Mark, did you have anything to add? Anna, Reese, Linda? Real quick, I would say, you know, in the meantime, while this is all getting sorted out and it will take some time, I think as communicators, we need to meet the other side on the battlefield, if you will, and use the same advertising tools, use the same you know, platforms and put messages out there. Even I mean, it costs money, but um, if, if that's where they're going to be uh, promulgating their side, you know, We've got to do the same. And I, actually, if I, if I could piggyback on that, uh, you know, one 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 question that that we've been trying to grapple with is the the appropriate role for social media companies to play mm -hmm. in, you know, in supporting the research that can address these questions, but also uh, supporting the, the interventions. Mm -hmm. And if if to, to the extent that, that these companies profit off of the spread of mis and disinformation, should they also be making their platforms available to public interest uh, information suppliers to be able to promulgate messages that that actually do serve the public interest, um, but at at a reduced or at a reduced cost or, or even for free? Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, John. And the, and I would say that's one of those issues that if there was a mis disinformation water cooler, that would be something that everybody talks about all the time like where is the balance yep. you know where is the line um mm -hmm. you know the public benefit to to having that kind of information is critical um so reese oh i'm sorry linda were you going to say something yeah I, I denise i'd like to add one more thing so we need to also look at the the, the audience side and i think mark mentioned this with digital digital health literacy we you know we need to look at building resilient communities uh, we need to take a human-centric approach and empower individuals through health literacy, digital health literacy, accurate information, um, and tools so that they can recognize mis- and disinformation so that all, all people can make health decisions that, that will have a positive impact on their health and the health of their communities. Very, very good point. Um, so I'm, I'm going to throw a question over to Reese because um, infodemic managers are new, right? They didn't exist <laughs> before COVID-19, that job that didn't correct. exist. Um, so how do you see the role evolving to include building resiliency within the communities you serve? I think you touched on a little bit. Yes, yeah, so um, the way I can best describe this is decentralization. So, you know, we talk about those um, trusted sources and um, one of the issues we had in even the DRC Ebola outbreak is all of these different um, public health professionals came in from all these different countries, and now they're dictating how this is all going to go. 
and it's no longer your local doctor. It's no longer your community leader. It's completely changed. So um, by addressing the kind of um, international approach, the infodemic manager is there, knows the country norms, can speak to this all a lot better, and can um, kind of respond to this misinformation in the appropriate context as well. To be honest, a lot of the messaging that comes out from public health organizations, people don't want to hear it at this point. They want to hear it from their local doctor or their um, parents, their family. They don't want to go beyond that. So by bringing this down and decentralizing how we pass this information back along, it allows not only to have a better context to approach the misinformation in a more um, direct way, but they don't rely on waiting around for the um, appropriate kind of debunking material to deal with it. It empowers um, them at the country level to act much more rapidly. So as they're looking into these uh, different vectors of communication that they know that, you know, HQ is not going to know or someone outside of the country won't be really familiar with, they can handle it in real time and jump on it a lot more quickly in a way that's coming from a more trusted source. People understand, you know, you're kind of one of us rather than, you know, it, coming from a foreign country that they don't really trust or a foreign organization that they, they've never interacted with before, that's really hard for them to jump on this bandwagon. Um, so over time, the WHO is gonna continue to build out these uh, country offices so they can all operate on their own and respond to this uh, much more quickly than we have in the past and uh, really try to build up that resiliency as well. Yeah, absolutely. Miss disinformation is a ground game all the way. Absolutely. All the way. Um, so from a storytelling perspective, um, we have a storyteller here, Mark. You mentioned you were a former journalist, worked with Bob Woodward. Um, what is the role of storytelling, based on what Reese just said, in countering mis and disinformation? And, and how can we build on it to affect change? Because I think it it ties into this this idea of trusted messenger on the ground, all of those things. So what do you think the opportunity is there? Yeah, I think it's got a huge role to play. Um, I'd argue even maybe the lead role, um, especially where health literacy isn't deep. You know, reams of data isn't going to help necessarily convince the skeptical. There's going to be a, a re reception issue there, right? But a well-executed story can resonate. It can touch those emotional triggers can change behavior. And uh, I think importantly, it, it can be shared along to other people in those networks on the ground. Um, in particular, I think conversions are always great stories, right? I was X, but then I changed my mind because of Y. Those are incredibly powerful and people can you know, feel an attachment to them. In a public health crisis like COVID, I mean, there are thousands, even millions of these types of stories out there. And I think, you know, we as communicators can be doing a better job of collecting them and sharing them early and often. Um, you know, outliers tend to get a lot of coverage, right? News has a bias toward the sensational, towards the outlier. And we have to recognize that. Um, and I think just massive numbers of stories told creatively and leveraging the unexpected. You know, if it's told in an unexpected way, in an unexpected place, it can cut cut through the clutter. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, it, it makes me think of listening as one of the things that we've sort of forgotten how to do, um, you know, as we're going on to different um, avenues, looking at mis and disinformation, you know, really critical listening to what people are saying versus just response. And storytelling is a is a joint activity. So I, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, I'm gonna pull in a question um, that we got early on. Um, how are we looking at finding ways to tackle the challenge of incentivizing a more complete access to information from across a variety of public and private sector community, corporation and coalition partners when a fully informed public sometimes conflicts with the interests of those communities, corporations, and coalition members. So essentially it's like mass communication. And I think Reese, this, this gets to your point, communal um, uh, communication. 
Um, Anna, I mean, do you have any thoughts from a research perspective as sort of how do you, is, has there been any research in this area in terms of um, uh, how to translate it from the mass to the, the local and if there's any um, particular outcomes? Um, no, I'm sorry. I don't think I understand the question. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated question. I'm going to throw it over to John because he has a look on his face like I want to answer it. So I'm going to <laughs> but Most definitely not. But I, I, I will say that <laughs> of, the folks who, who, of the folks who I think are thinking in this space and have the kind of, um, uh, the kind of legitimacy to, to propose you know, tr true solutions are folks like Karen Kornblue at the German Marshall Fund. Um, she, she and Ellen Goodman, uh, another another great person, have been uh, have been working together on um, on a series of, of, of different reports that um, that kind of propose a path forward that doesn't involve a ton of new legislation, but that leverages the the uh, um, the, the regulatory infrastructure that we already have and the the other sorts of infrastructure through uh, like the, the the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and so forth um, to better. You know, help help align incentives um, that that could ostensibly lead to a to a, 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 a better and what Sam says is a, a more fully informed public. Absolutely, absolutely. That was a that was a little bit of a tough question. Whoever sent that in, that was a tough one. Um, so Anna, I wanted to touch to go back to you know I've I have that picture of that you put up on the screen of sort of those priorities um, and you, you there were five understudied research areas um, and you talked about them quite a bit but is there anything that that sticks out to you based on on that framework for how to build a resilient information environment because um, research is is critical as John has already said. Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, basically we need to understand better what's going on, uh, what the information environment is. Um, and we also, I think, need to do a better job of understanding what, what is happening after people see the message, right? I don't think we have a really good understanding of whether people mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, or are acting on what they're seeing mm -hmm. or not. I think we sort of are assuming that that's happening because you know we see a lot of you know anti-vaccine misinformation online and then we're seeing a lot of hesitancy in the real world and we're assuming that's connected but i don't think we know and i don't think and you know it's also possible that there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy you know in the real world and people are just writing about it on social media and that's why we're seeing it um and so i think we need we need to just honestly talk to people and ask them you know like how they're thinking about the information that they're getting, um, if they just believe whatever they, like, I think that that's a little bit simplistic that we just assume that people um, see something and they just automatically believe that it's true. I think, I don't think we're giving people enough credit for it. I think it's kind of complicated. Um, there was a study that came out a couple of years ago by um, Unaira Rivera, and she had people come in to her lab and log into their Facebook accounts um, and and just go through all of the cancer related posts that they had interacted with. And, um, you know, they, they noticed that people interacted with a lot of, um, with a lot of posts that uh, were about like natural remedies that had no evidence base behind them. But when they asked people, you know, when they interviewed people about, you know, why you clicked on this and everything, people didn't believe that, you know, eating a certain food would cure cancer, they just sort of understood it as like, oh, this food is good for you, right? So it's not that they just like automatically without thinking about it, just accepted the claim. Um, and so I think, you know, it's a little bit more complicated how people are actually processing what they see, whether they're acting on it, whether they believe it, whether they, you know, they understand that a lot of the information is sort of misinformation, but they think it might be useful anyway in, in other, in other areas because you know they understand that people are just sort of sensationalistic with these kinds of things but it could also be just a healthy food that is information that they find useful that they don't get in other places and so i think you know we really need to just actually understand how people are processing and using the information that they're getting online and whether they actually believe it and whether they're acting on it i don't think we know the answer to that at this point Do yeah you 
Yeah, I was just going to bring it over to you, Linda, because that yeah. that's a critical point. Because being able to understand mm-hmm. how people are translating that information, there's a number of factors. And Linda, you talked a little bit about it in the the introduction, but I think that's an important point, Anna. Yeah, and thank you, Denise. I wanted to um, add on to what Anna said because I think what she said with you know understanding what is happening after they see the message is really really important, and that's why we do message testing you know with community members. For example, in our work in Central Valley, California, with the migrant uh, farmer community, you know we did a message testing with the promotoras. I never do the accent right, but with the promotoras or the community health workers. We did our message testing in Spanish and we developed the message messages in, in, in Spanish also. And it was really interesting to get their feedback. For example, um, we showed them even the graphics that we were going to use in our social media graphics, like the, the pictures and our, our assets. And we said, hey, well, this, would this, does this reflect your community members? You know, when a lot of times we can get things from, you know, certain image companies that sell the graphics but you know we showed them pictures of hispanic families and they said you know when we knock on doors and we go into people's homes one of the first things we see are you know dirty boots dirty shoes and this is a reflection of the working families you know that that is our community and it's important to reflect that not only in the messaging but in our images as well so you know so thank you anna for for mentioning that because message testing is is really important and something that we include you know after we develop the message we just don't throw it out there yeah yeah i think it's important that that it it represents um the community so you know sometimes i look at um messaging and marketing and i think wow this folk you know it's like a gap ad and Mm -hmm. for a health issue and i'm like these are not real people so they don't they don't really resonate as um as well as they could and i think that those are all excellent points um and i know um we're, I, there's one question I wanted to ask John, and then we we have to start um, wrapping it up because it, it came through and I think, um, I know we're getting close to the end. So John, I'm gonna ask you to be brief and then we'll, we'll start you know, wrapping it up. This has been a great conversation. Um, so, um, both you and Mark had talked about sort of the, the the gaps in research and health literacy and all these different gaps or opportunities to address these critical challenges. Um, What do you think are, is, is the path forward there? I mean, you look at a lot of research, you see what people are doing. Um, Where is there an opportunity there? Where are there gaps or or opportunities? You're talking about on the translational question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think that as as funding for research in this space has ramped up in in the past several years, um, the 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 volume of of research outputs has increased far far you know far faster <laughs> and, and, and at, a, at a much you know greater velocity than 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 the the kind of built in capacity uh, that think tanks. And, uh, and and you know um, civil society organizations have to be able to uh, to actually a- activate on it and um, there, there's also you know on the academic side there's there's the challenge of uh, you know of, of research insights actually getting through peer review in time for somebody to be able to do something with it. and there's so there's been an enormous growth in pre-publications um some good and, and actually quite a few that that have uh, you know even even during the covid crisis have proven to be you know really off the mark um once once um they they, they went through additional scrutiny so you know i think that on on one side on the academic side um there's an enormous opportunity to to help rethink what the peer review process looks like and ha- how to get um, research insights, um, you know, kind of how to get knowledge verified 
uh, more quickly so that we can do something with it um, before, you know, before it, things get too too far down the road, um, as as seems to have happened both with COVID, um, certainly happened with the 2016 and the 2020 elections, um, and you know the, the next the next big crisis is just around the corner. Um, and, and then on the 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 policy and civil society um, side of the equation, you know, there really there are two two challenges. One is one is resources. And the other is the talent pipeline. Like right now, there there's a, an enormous shortage of of talent, of expert of, of expertise, folks who actually uh, have the kind of uh, academic background to be able to understand what's in some of the the basic research outputs, uh, and then who also have that kind of translational uh, prowess to be able to and, and and you know storytelling prowess to be able to. Um, to get it into the hands of, of policymakers and the folks who, who are on the ground who can who can actually leverage it and do something with it. Um, so those those are those are my two thoughts. Yeah, making those connections, right? Where's the crossover and where's the collaboration? Yep. So that I think that's critically important. Um, but the time has flown, and I'm and um, all sorts of warning lights are going off for um, this having to conclude. So I, I'm super excited and I, I thank you all very much, panelists. Um, I could talk about this all day, um, but my producer will not let me do that. So, and you guys have to, to go off to your, to your lives, but we really appreciate it. Um, we've had a wonderful discussion and I wanna close um, by not only thanking you, but you have one word what is the thing we need to do to move us forward to build a resilient information environment? Really quickly, starting with John. Better, more and better translation. Anna. Research. Mark. Storytelling. <laughs> Reese. Understanding. Oh, that's a good one. Linda. Empowerment. Wow. Oh. All, all great answers. You all get an A. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you to Sarah, uh, Assistant Secretary Sarah Levenheim and, and our esteemed panelists for a wonderful conversation. A recording of this broadcast will be available on demand and you re can return to this page um, for more information on the HYPE framework, um, Explore the Hype Team's research article um, that Linda mentioned, um, the COVID-19 vaccine discourse on Twitter, content analysis, um, and um, everyone attending today will receive a follow-up survey. Please fill it out. Um, we love when you fill out the survey and we appreciate your feedback. You may also send further comments to labs at MITRE.org and policy at MITRE.org. One last reminder that MITRE is hiring. So if you would like to work um, at MITRE or if you, you have thoughts on how you could help us solve some of these great challenges that you heard about today, uh, please reach out to recruitinghelp at MITRE.org for more information. And finally, our next Grand Challenge Power Hour will be on Thursday, July 21st. Um, next month, we will turn our attention to AI assurance in industries and mission critical systems. Sounds exciting. Um, we hope you will join MITRE as we unite diverse experts from industry, government, academia to address the important role of collaboration in producing responsible AI technologies that support our shared values. A link to register for that event is in the chat. And I thank you again for joining us this afternoon. This has been a wonderful discussion and um, really appreciate your time. Have a great evening.